Hey, Troop Loaders! I am Michael Stevens from the YouTube channel Vsauce. What was your background prior to uh, being a kick ass mother? Hello and welcome to our live debate. Check out our new fancy background. We're talking about cyber hacking and whether or not it is the future of warfare. Get your comments and questions in straight away because we have an awesome bunch of guests that we're going to be able to read them out to. So why are we doing this? Well, when we think of war, the words war, what do we imagine? Two great powers colliding and in the middle, middle thousands of men all pitted against each other. Well, certainly that was the kind of war we saw in World War one, hundreds of men all pointing their guns at each other, firing and firing until one side quits. But with advances in technology became our more efficient killing machines. We saw bombing raids and entire cities able to be leveled to the ground and completely destroyed. But as time went on, uh, enemies became less and less well defined and more difficult to say who you were after and who you were not after though the tactic of dropping as many bombs as possible doesn't seem to have gone away just yet a computer virus called Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the data banks of power plant I think someone pressed the button too soon maybe we've been hacked but um, as we March into the future, day by day, the rules of engagement are changing rapidly. Uh, so quick that Stuxnet, the world's first uh, code weapon, was discovered in 2010. A computer virus called Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the data banks of power plants, traffic control systems, and factories around the world. 20 times more complex than any previous virus code, it had an array of capabilities. Among them, the ability to turn up the pressure inside nuclear reactors or switch off oil pipelines and Stuxnet could tell the system operators everything was normal. Stuxnet was a weapon, the first to be made entirely out of code. And it isn't just nation states that are at this. There has, of course, been the unmissable rise of hacker groups such as Anonymous. They're brazen, they're bold, and they've even been so brave as to identify entire nations as their targets during their operations. This is why that on April 7th, elite cyber squadrons from around the world have decided to unite in solidarity with the Palestinian people against Israel as one entity to disrupt and erase Israel from cyberspace. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. To the government of Israel, it is too late to expect us. Hannah Evans is keen to point out that they fired rifles during World War One, not guns. So thanks very much for your comment. Get your comments coming in. We're going to be able to read some of them out. So as we've seen, is cyber hacking the future of warfare? Are we perhaps past the stage at which many men have to die during conflict? And what kind of world are we walking into? And the question that's most interesting for me is who is really going to be in control? We have an awesome collection of guests, some very clever people on Truth Loader today. We have Richard Wang, who is the manager of Sophos Labs US, US operations, and he educates users on the threats posed by cyber criminals. We have Clement Guiton, he's a PhD student in war studies at the department at King's. We have Professor Wolf von Heineck, a U.S. Naval College Stockton professor, and he was one of the drafters of the Tallinn Manual on Cyber Warfare. And also from Tor Project, we have Runa Sandvik. Tor Project allows uh, people to browse data anonymously and to create data anonymously. But let's start with you, Professor Wolf. We saw a very, very short video there about Stuxnet. It claimed that it was the world's first all-code weapon. Is that the case? And if it is the case, why is that significant? Well, you don't expect another answer from a lawyer, then it depends, of course. But let's be rather clear on that. Um, 
I would hesitate to use the term weapon, but uh, the, that malware, of course, inflicted damage on the centrifuges that were used in the nuclear installation. If we can assume that it was um, fed into the system by a state, and it was, it, if it was done for military purposes, this would amount to a use of force that under international law would only be allowed if it was uh, done in self-defense or if it uh, had some other legal justification. So the real aspect about Stuxnet is that it could con be considered a use of force of one state against another state, which would probably then uh, lead to international reactions. I would, however, not uh, consider Stuxnet to be an armed attack that would trigger the right of self-defense by the target state, in this case, Iran. So you, what you're saying is that even though the virus or the worm has the potential to do serious damage in that it can speed up centrifuges and that can obviously lead to some very serious problems, it isn't actually uh, something that uh, countries can legally say we are able to defend ourselves against this with force. Is that the case? Well, I say that you cannot defend yourself uh, by using force, but of course, if you consider the attack as such, it would probably constitute a violation of international law, and the target state would have all options below the threshold of the right of self-defense. So they could resort to countermeasures and all other kinds of reactions international law allows the injured state to take. Come on, what do you make of this? Uh, do we know who was behind Stuxnet? Because it was an incredibly sophisticated piece of technology. What do we know about the people who made it? Yes. Um, thanks for having me first. Um, we, we, we know quite a good deal about Stuxnet and also about the people who engineered it. Apparently, a journalist called David Sanger had access to sources in the US that exposed Stuxnet as an Israeli-American um, joint operation. Now, if I, if I may just come back to uh, your first question when you asked if it was the first cyber weapon. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. The, just putting aside the definition of weapon just for a moment, if we just focus on destructions, and it's what many people seem to be referring to because Stuxnet destroyed a couple of thousands of nuclear centrifuges. It wasn't the first incident where industrial control systems were targeted by someone. So in 2001, for instance, there was this example in Australia of a hacker who breached into the Marucci plant and released liters of sewage which flooded a village. So that was, in the very, that was probably one of the very first attacks on an industrial control system, which had many consequences. Now, if that's also called a weapon, because it, it had physical destructions, well, we need to look at what is a weapon. And a weapon usually has these two characteristics. It's either something that is used to compel someone or that is at least threatening someone so that it compels them to do something. And so... And, uh, yes. Sorry, go ahead. So, in the case of Stuxnet, um, the, the destruction element is, is very much there, but the fact did it really compel Iran to do anything about its nuclear program, which allegedly is what the US and Israel wanted Iran to do, that's a bit... It's, it's a, a bit more difficult to give an answer, but it seems that they haven't modified their, um, their intent, at least, into... Richard, you... Sorry, yeah. It, R Richard, let's go to come to you. You're the manager of Sophos Labs, and you advise people and, and clients how they can defend themselves against um, perhaps not attacks as sophisticated as this, but it was it's claimed that Stuxnet relied on zero days. Now, these are... Um, holes in security that are, the, the designers of those systems don't even know about themselves. So Stuxnet was actually open sourced, so people can tinker around with the code, take a look at it, uh, rework it. Does it still pose a threat because of that? Um, well, thanks for having you, and thanks for having me. And first of all, I have to issue a slight correction. I am not 
any longer the manager of Sophos Labs. Um, I'm uh, currently an ind independent security consultant, so anything I say okay. here today uh, is not on behalf of Sophos or Sophos Labs. Um, but um, with regard to your, your question about Stuxnet, certainly what what are, firstly, zero days, what they really consist of, as you say, are security holes or flaws in a piece of software that are basically bugs left in there by accident um, by the designers or unwittingly by the designers of that software. Um, and these are then researched and found by various researchers and used typically to break into systems to get into a system and take control of it. Um, now the ones that were used by Stuxnet have since been patched and what that means is that the security companies who uh, wrote the software or the companies that wrote the software that had holes in it have issued updates to that software. So those, those zero days no longer pose a serious threat to people who are keeping themselves up to date and that is one of the, the key pieces of advice that that can be offered to organizations to protect themselves against these kind of threats is make sure that whatever software you're using, you know, it is up to date, you have all the latest security patches. Um, but the other thing to bear in mind is, of course, with holes in software, any piece of software that's sufficiently complicated to be useful almost certainly has bugs and security deficiencies in it. And there are people out there searching all the time for these, and they have many outlets when they find them. Some people will simply report them to the company that wrote the software, you know, doing, doing their bit for the community and uh, getting the software fixed. Um, others will sell them to criminal organizations on the black market um, and they will use them for online crime, not the same as online warfare, but um, still a significant economic effect on a lot of businesses. Um, and thirdly now we're starting to see the business of selling new zero days and new exploits to governments, to security organizations who are intending to use them for purposes either like Stuxnet or for uh, cyber espionage, for breaking into other networks and monitoring what's going on there. I have a question here that leads on from the, the point you've made there, Richard. It's from Hannah Evans, uh, and a number of people have kind of echoed this. Uh, perhaps, Press of Wolf, you can answer this. Does anyone think that North Korea could use these kinds of cyber attacks? Well, well what you have to keep in mind is, is everybody is so obsessed by Stuxnet because, uh, well, it was the open, uh, first example that has been reported about. But what you have to understand is that uh, most militaries, uh, modern armed uh, for forces today, are heavily dependent on cyberspace for all kinds of purposes. In view of that, they are vulnerable. Uh, states are also vulnerable in other sectors than the military. And uh, you will always have to expect that uh, an aggressor uh, or the enemy, whoever the enemy is, could be a state, could be a non-state actor, will of course try to exploit those vulnerabilities, be it for genuinely military purposes or for other purposes. That's a fact of life today. Rune, let's come to you because a lot of this, uh, a lot of cyber warfare is traceable, or it has been, because uh, as much of an effort as you put into kind of covering your steps, there are ways to trace you from what you've done. But Tor Project really makes your uh, online activity very, very difficult to track down. Could you perhaps explain why Tor Project, uh, the Onion Router, and the dark web underneath the traditional internet is really making hacking? Uh, easier to do perhaps? Huh. Um, well, so Tor enables anyone to be anonymous online, to browse whatever website they want, to access any type of content they want completely anonymously. So it, it, it just cannot be traced back to you. And I think that is, it protects a lot of people. It was certainly not designed with the purpose of allowing people to hack each other. Um, and with that said, I mean, if Tor didn't exist, if people didn't use Tor for this purpose, there was, you know, there would be a number of other tools that would enable people to do the same thing. So, um, Tor, is it possible to shut something down uh, like Tor? Because there are things that take place on Tor that I'm sure that many elements of the United States government would like to see stopped. 
But is it actually possible now? Is the cat out of the bag and will it go back in? Um, I would not say that the cat would go back in the bag. I think uh, Tor and Hidden Services, which you refer to as the deep web, um, it's not something that you can shut down. That's, that's kind of the goal. It's supposed to be so um, kind of spread out and decentralized that you cannot shut it down, that you cannot control it. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. And do you think that makes people like Anonymous? I know they're not a group. Do you make it's a tool that makes ordinary citizens perhaps slightly more powerful than they've been in the past. Do you agree? Yeah, I think you know there has been research that shows that uh, people who are part of a group and believe that they are anonymous and that their actions are untraceable are more likely to do things that they otherwise wouldn't. And so, sure, I mean, using, using Tor or any other type of tool that allows you to hide who you are and what you're doing um, probably does, um, I guess, encourage more people to do these things. Professor Wolf, what do you make of Anonymous? Are they a group that is... Uh, the structure of the group seems almost impossible to stop because the group is not really a group. It's an idea that anybody can associate themselves uh, with. It moves very, very, very quickly. It's almost impossible to trace who ever did what. And yet, as we've seen over the past uh, three or four years, they've been fairly effective at times, uh, embarrassing the United States government or other, other governments. Can they actually be stopped now? Or is the technology so great that they really uh, are a pretty strong organization at this point? Well, first of all, I wouldn't overestimate uh, Anonymous. Uh, I mean, look at the damage they have inflicted. It's not really so severe that we must be over-concerned. I don't say that they haven't inflicted damage, but it has been rather moderate, to put it that way. Uh, first, and the second uh, issue, what you are addressing is, are they a group that in the one or the other way could be dealt with under international law? That is indeed a problem because it lacks a clear structure, it lacks a hierarchy. So uh, for all kinds of purposes it would be most difficult. This, however, does not prevent states to take appropriate measures against those who they, who they can identify. And yes, attributability and tracing certain attacks back is a problem, but at least the Mandiant report that was uh, published a couple of weeks ago has shown us that uh, sometimes you can be rather certain from where a certain attack has been launched and then you would of course be in a position to take measures against it. Uh, can, I just, can I just comment on a couple of points? Yes, of course, please go ahead. So it's the Manjian report you, you just uh, commented on, but it has many flows on how it attributes the attack to the military from a technical standpoint. And that's the, that's the idea I want to, to go back to is Tor may actually not make attribution harder in the sense that for attributing states, actions, uh, cyber attacks to states it usually hasn't been via technical means. So if we look at Stuxnet, it has been because sources have come forward. If we look at Mundian, it seems that their conclusion is still reasonable because of circumstantial evidence and because of other attacks that we know about. So Tor may, in the end, maybe make attribution more difficult only for criminals would use it. But then it, it assumes that criminals are going to launch attacks via Tor. And that also raises a couple of questions. So, for instance, launching denial of service attacks via Tor is very slow, very difficult, so it makes it a bit unlikely. So it doesn't leave much room to use Tor and to use other services like Tor to actually thwart attributions, meaning that there are other ways to go around it as well. I've got some comments here and uh, another question from our audience. One is from Shehab Imam who says $1.3 billion in damage isn't severe, OMG. I think he's referring to uh, MasterCard and Visa and perhaps PayPal. Um, Hannah Evans has a question. She says, could, the, could making the average person more powerful through hacking be a good thing? Runa, what do you think about that? I... Um that's a good question. I'm not sure if it would be necessarily a good thing. Um, yeah, and uh, just to kind of piggyback on um, the comment about using Tor for hacking, it's it is it is true that um, Tor is kind of too slow to do anything. There's no efficient way to do any type of DDoS attack using Tor. 
and the criminals who do want to kind of make some serious impact or serious damage will always have better tools available. Um, if, if we could talk about WikiLeaks for a moment, uh, Professor Wolf and Clement, uh, in fact, uh, Richard and Rune, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. In any war, propaganda is absolutely key. Uh, this was w learned way, way, way back that to win a war you needed to win the information war. Is the kind of thing that WikiLeaks is doing a kind of cyber warfare? Is leaking a document a kind of cyber warfare? What do you make of that, Come on. Um, well, I'd say warfare needs to have three characteristics. Um, it needs to be political, it needs to be instrumental, and so we have loads of cases where these two characteristics have met. But the last one, it has to be violent. And when you leak document, it seems pretty clear that that falls within sort of breaching confidentiality or within espionage, and you wouldn't call that violent. So if you put it in another context, maybe if you look at it in the 70s or earlier before the internet, how a leak would have happened, you would have gone with a suitcase maybe in an organization, you would have taken a couple of documents out of the organization, and you would have published them in a newspaper. You would have never called that war. You would have never called that uh, a, a violent attack. So you would have just called that espionage. So it seems to me that it's more like espionage than anything else. Professor Wolf, what do you think? Well, I agree with regard to the question of whether it's war. It's certainly not war. It's not even an act of war. You can say it's a stupidity uh, because you are disclosing information and you are making people vulnerable because their names have been published and made known to all, everybody who wanted to read those reports. But again, yes, it is probably a crime. It's certainly some act of disclosure of confidential material which would be punishable under the domestic law of the respective country, but under the aspect of international law or the law of armed conflict, it's irrelevant. Rune, I've got a question here for you. I think uh, you should get it answered. It's from SuperZXOZ who says, uh, in light, I guess he's referring to the things that Anonymous and LulzSec and perhaps even Tor are doing. Here is my question. Do you think that the government is going to implement draconian internet laws and use fear-mongering of cybercrime to limit internet freedoms? Uh, they're certainly trying. I mean, with all the different laws that are being discussed in the U.S. at least, um, and in the U.K., um, there's, you know, they're trying. Uh, whether or not it's actually going to go through with anything is a totally different question. Um, I hope not. I know a lot of people are working to prevent uh, the government in the U.S. and in the U.K. to kind of prevent them from implementing these laws. Um, and, and hopefully we don't see any of them actually be implemented. If I, I may say... Question here, this room. Yes, please do, Professor Wolf. Do, do uh, weigh in on that. Uh, I, I have a little problem with that statement, uh, not because of what was said, but who was addressed. Uh, let me remind you that during the uh, latest ITU conference, the U.S. and other countries were amongst those who were protecting and defending the freedom of the Internet and the operability, interoperability of the Internet against some states who have certainly other ideas about it. And uh, I don't understand why so often the U.S. is being looked upon as a country that would be hostile vis-à-vis -vis Internet freedoms. To the contrary, they understand that it is profitable from the economic and from the political point of view. There are other countries that seem to be less suspicious, but who have far-reaching domestic roots with regard to the control of communications, just to mention Sweden, that because they call themselves a consensus government, uh, do, are doing things that we in our countries would certainly not uh, cherish or uh, agree upon. Such as what? Well, such as, for example, controlling all kinds of communication. Every SMS you uh, are writing in Sweden is being stored and could be controlled any time the govern government wishes to do so. That is Hasn't impossible. It been it hasn't it been suggested that a very similar thing is happening uh, in the United States, that all communications are now being stored? Well, every government, to the one or the other extent, tries of, tries, of course, to get hold of certain information for all kinds of purposes. Just think about the European Union with regard to the question of which data are being stored for the purpose of criminal prosecutions and the like. So everybody is doing it to the one or to the other extent. 
but there are some cases that are far more extreme than the cases we have been just talking about, for example, in the US or in the UK or, by the way, in Germany. Uh, Richard, what do you make of it? Do you think that uh, people's freedoms online may well be encroached? Um, I think they are, but I think there's there's two different aspects to this. There's the aspects of governments wanting to monitor for, say, the enforcement of law um, or the enforcement of trade agreements. And then there are other more severe aspects, things like we saw um, in Egypt during the Arab Spring when effectively the Egyptian government managed to virtually cut off the country of Egypt from the rest of the internet um, because they had only a few links out, a few major links out from the country to, to other countries around the world. They were able to cut off those few links and that left, left the citizens with very little access to outside information and ways to communicate outside the country what was actually going on. Um, and I think those are really much more severe in terms of the abuse of power of a government over its people and over um, internet access within its country. I've got a few comments here and then uh, I'll read the final questions if that's possible. Midnight Lamb says there's an element of mischief to hacking. It might empower um, people but the general public can be empowered in other ways that is less likely to make them enemies of the state. Um, another question, people are interested to know whether Macs are really more secure than Windows but I think we'll leave that one for the moment since it's been answered. Freak number one says when corporations stop hacking the public I think Anonymous should stop hacking the corporations and Professor Wolf, the evil mammal is keen to let you know that you have an awesome voice so just thought I'd point that out. Now the final question I'd like to ask you is this, at this moment in time with all the technology available to all of us, who is the most powerful? Is it states? Is it still the state, not the United States, but nation states or the people? And what kind of world do you think we're beginning to wander into? So Luna, what do you think about those two questions? Whether or not the state is more powerful than the people? Um, yes. It's a tough question to answer. The problem is usually you don't really know what kind of powers the state actually has. They don't really tell you. Um, I don't know, probably state. But I'd like to have to guess, then probably state. <laughs> and what kind of, with all this technology that we now, we now have, Luna, things like Tor, things that Anonymous is taking advantage of, what do you think the future holds for the way conflict will be resolved? Uh, interesting question. Um, I was actually at a conference yesterday where the topic of um, cyber war and whether or not you can make international law apply to cyberspace and things like that was discussed and it just became clear that even if you could find a part of like international law that actually would apply to cyberspace it would be really hard to kind of regulate or control and kind of get anyone to agree with what is allowed and what's not allowed and what should be done. Um, Richard, what do you think? What kind of world do you think we're wandering into with the technology now available to many ordinary citizens? Um, I think it's, it's a, a very interesting world, but I think one of the things that's missing from that equation is, is it the people or is it the government, is also um, corporate interests, because a lot of the infrastructure on which the technology we use is built is not owned by governments, it's, not, it's owned by large corporations and a lot of the information that we put out there that people are interested in is also held by large organizations, the most obvious one being say uh, Google or Facebook, organizations, organizations like that who have a vast amount of data um, on people. Uh, in terms of who has the most power I think still that probably does rest uh, with governments because ultimately they have the power to come in with court orders and have infrastructure shut down or turned over to them if they need to. Um, as to whether future wars will be cyber wars, I think it's inevitable that future wars will have a cyber aspect to them if they're between adversaries who rely on uh, technology infrastructure. I think any technology has been ultimately used for war since the, you know, since the invention of the spear. So, Clement, what so. do you think? What kind of world are we headed into with, uh, with all of the technology now available to nation states, to corporations, and to even groups of ordinary people? Yes, 
Uh, I'd like to challenge a bit the, the idea uh, that I've been given so far. So I'd like to start by um, splitting the threat maybe into two different groups. We have uh, espionage clearly on one side, and we have clearly the attack on infrastructure and on critical national infrastructure, probably industrial control system on the other side. And I think there are two different types of threats. So for espionage, we've had criminal groups that have shown extreme sophistication and have shown themselves to have really good tools so that they could spy on many people, get their credit card details and so on, and going on without any impunity. So I think on this side, espionage, the state, state actors definitely don't have the monopoly anymore and they're not the only actors there who can get the information even if it's, even if it's like really tricky information to get. Then on the other side, we have all the targeting of industrial control systems and to engineer weapons or to engineer codes, malware that are probably alike to Stuxnet. And in this area, you need two things. You need, again, intelligence, so which is via espionage, which non-state actors like individuals probably have the capacity to, to acquire. And then the other side is to test, to engineer, and to refine whatever malware you're going to send to if it's a, towards a specific nuclear plant or towards a specific electrical grid and so on. And this capacity of maybe testing your malware on a specific SCADA system or on a specific industrial control system may still be only available to states. But criminals, Perfect. they're also very ingenious and also we shouldn't dismiss also too fast their capabilities to do so. Professor Wolf, what kind of world are we headed into? Well, first of all, uh, I agree with those who are looking at uh, the cyber threat uh, from the perspective of non-state actors. Uh, of course, states do have cap capabilities, probably exceeding those of private individuals. Um, certainly, they could not do that without private actors like private companies because they are running the business, more or less. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have to see that uh, prudent states that are acting on a rational basis will rather refrain from inflicting severe damage on another state for the simple reason that they are equally vulnerable and that they would uh, of course have to face a response. So the biggest threat I think is organized crime, probably terrorism, indeed non-state actors and uh, state to state I hope that most governments are go uh, guided by rational reasons rather than by some uh, motives that would rather be genuine to uh, a 14-year-old than to a grown-up. <laughs> Richard Wang, Kremic uh, Gitan, Professor Wolf uh, and Runa Sambik, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to leave on a comment that's been left by Midnight Lamb. He or she, I do apologize, says, it's a new world out there. We all need to adapt and face new challenges with new thoughts, ideas, methods, and principles. And I think that's a pretty good way to end this conversation. So thank you once again to all, all our contributors and to everyone who asked the question and watched online. It will be available to uh, watch again, but make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you again next time.